Hey everybody, so today we're going to be playing the Innsmouth case, a Lovecrafty and visual novel thanks to Assemble Entertainment. I'm sure our madness will outshine the Lovecraftian madness as well. Hopefully Cthulhu will make an appearance, then I can classify this as hentai. I'm very excited about it, let's hop right in. There's going to be a lot of uh, speaking during this, so hopefully there will be a little bit of commentary, a little bit not. Um, I thought this would be better as a YouTube video than a Strim Stram. So I hope you enjoy. All right, so welcome to the Innsmouth case. So first off, I'm going to try and figure out what these are. I would assume this is settings, right? Yeah, so text speed's pretty good. This will erase any progress in the story, including endings achieved and places discovered. All right, the compass. Select a location to refresh your memories. Ah, so this is basically load game. And then uh, this. Achievements. Those were the days before you had started the game. Uh, some inter- What? I need the shark one for brand purposes. Is that McDragon? What is this? This looks like a McDonald's uh, in olden times. Like if you were in Skyrim and suddenly Ronald McDonald set up shop. All right, so let's start a new game. I've never played this before. Boston, Massachusetts, your office forward. We are fans of the strange world of Innsmouth, but we recognize the problematic beliefs of H.P. Lovecraft. This game has been produced by a group of people who believe in inclusion and equality. Boston, 21st of September. Man, this is like an office from a Raymond Chandler novel. The last rays of sunshine filter through the blinds of your empty office. The pathetic stench of whiskey, cold cigarette smoke, and canned ravioli fills the air, but not Oxford commas. The screeching tires and constant beeping of car horns out there on the street tell you that it's gone 8 p.m. People are on their way home, finishing their day. You should join them. I like anything that tells me that I should just go home. <laughs> uh, go ham or go home. You breathe a deep sigh. It may not have been a successful day, but at least it's over. That's a big 2020 mood. You are looking forward to a classic Friday night, watching old mystery series at home in sweatpants and getting drunk on cheap booze. Have they been watching me? My love of Columbo knows no bounds. Since the early afternoon, you have been staring at the foreboding bottle of liquor at the other end of the room. Up until now, a vague sense of professionalism has kept you from drinking yourself into oblivion. Now nothing stands in the way. This is why I love darts. Like, you can just drink while on the job. Suddenly, you hear someone at the door. Don't make a sound. Just pretend like you're not here. We're closed. That's how I used to deal with customer service. Say, who is it? The door slowly cracks open with a timid creak. The unknown guest pauses. Then, in a breathy and melodic tone, you hear a woman utter, Hello? Your insides cramp. You suddenly realize that you haven't cleaned your office at all this year. You... Why would you Why would you care if your office is a little messy? Do you think she's going to give you a bad Yelp review? Invite her in. Ooh, okay, lady. <laughs> Anyone wearing a beret has no shame. We're good. By the light of the desk lamp, you now see more than a silhouette. A breathtaking woman lights up your office, probably just with her cigarette. No doubt older than 40, maybe even 50, hard to say. Clad in black, a skin-tight dress culminating in a décolleté that seems to defy the laws of gravity. A smoky eye shadow, as dark as algae, washed ashore. I think I saw that YouTube makeup tutorial. Blonde, coiffed, wavy hair under a dark beret. The faint light of the setting sun catches in the strands of her hair, and you wonder how many heads this woman must have turned during her prime. She's completely different from your usual customers. Nervous bankers with sweat stains under their armpits convince their wives have something going on with the mailman. Every move she makes is calculated grace. Smooth as an eel, she walks towards you and sits down on the corner of your desk. Sorry, Miss Jackson, I am four eels. Determined, she walks towards you and sits down on the corner of your desk, which is a little bold. She makes you blush. Never before has a visitor parked their derriere so skillfully on the corner of this desk. You hope that the cigarette butt the stranger has just sat on won't leave any difficult stains. The dress looks expensive. When she starts talking, her, her voice is smoky and full of promise. My name is Dahlia Marsh. I'm looking for a private investigator. I was told you are one of the best. She extends her hand. You've come to the right place, lady. What can I do for you? You sit back in your chair and fold your hands over your stomach. The woman seems a little irritated that her provocative behavior seems to have had no effect on you. She moves from the edge of the desk and sits down on the chair opposite you. Uh, yes, I... She clears her throat. 
<laughs> I'm available for voice acting. Uh, Snickers uh, to clear your throats. As she continues to speak, the smoky seductiveness creeps back into her voice. My name is Dahlia. I need help. First, maybe you should put out your cigarette. There's a lot of smoky voice going on. Ask for more details. It's about my daughter, Tabitha. She has disappeared. You're pulling out paper and pencil. This is going to be a walk in the park. A walk in the kidnapped kid's park. I would stop going there if it's known for that. Well, when did you last see her and where? The woman puts on a fake smile. We live in Innsmouth. It's a small port town north of Arkham. Maybe you should get Batman instead then. You frown. This is a bit vague. What was your child doing when you last saw her? What hobbies does she have? Oh, you know, kid stuff. They just run around and uh, play with their yo-yos, that sort of thing. I actually, I was in a yo-yo club when I was a teenager, so that is true. Right? That's true, guys, right? Dolly and nervously combs her hands through her hair. Does your daughter have any friends? Yo-yos? <laughs> Look, listen, all right? This is a, it's a realistic skill toy for children. Hold on. Yo-yos? Ring, ring. Can you hear that? It's the 90s calling, and they want their outdated toys back. Dahlia blushes. Normally, you would find this quite attractive. But the case of a missing girl beckons, and you're utterly unconvinced by the way this woman pretends to be a mother. Confront her. Something's fishy here. You have a nose for this sort of thing. That's why you became a private investigator. Or, to be more precise, that's why you took an online detective course that, for a one-off fee, provided the necessary qualification. It's time to take your visitor to task. You didn't take those Indeed quizzes for nothing. You look at her closely. Why'd you come to me? You get out of your chair. Inn's mouth is several miles away from here. Why do you want to hire me? I wouldn't even hire myself. Dolly crosses her arms. What do you care? Do you want to be paid or not? Charge extra expenses. Right now, I just want the truth. Right now, I just want the truth. You're sticking to your principles. That's exactly what your instructor warned you about. Still, it feels good. Dahlia takes a step back and releases her tightly crossed arms. I already tried loads of other investigators. Anyone who seemed trustworthy, really, but no luck. That's why I'm coming to you. Oh, I love being second best. Third, maybe fourth. Ouch. Let's accept the case, sure. You nod. A missing persons case. Nothing unusual. The conventional little girl runs away from home after reading her first romance novel. Damn you, John Green! Usually they hide at the edge of the forest or in a library. Should be pretty straightforward. Before you can say anything, she drops a photo of the child and a roll of bills on your desk for your expenses. You nod slowly, trying not to drool down the front of your shirt. You haven't seen this much money in ages. I do know that independent contract work is difficult. You don't have much time to prepare. A quick search reveals that only one bus goes to Innsmouth and only once a day. A pattern emerges in your research. The few news items related to this little coastal town are all about missing persons. In addition, you find some rather old-fashioned articles that praise the coastal town as a secret holiday destination, the best fish, untouched beach promenade, authentic fishing people are the recurring buzzwords. I think untouched beach promenade because everybody's missing. Dolly has given you the address at which you're supposed to drop off her daughter as soon as you find her. She also wrote down her phone number on the child's photo. You take another look at the picture before you pack your things. Whoa! <laughs> she got her father's looks, I hope. The next morning you travel. Well, shit, was that photo taken in a funhouse mirror? By hitchhiking? This seems like a bad idea. By bus. Why would I? I mean, money must be really difficult. Boston, the 22nd of September. Your journey begins at a busy bus station. There is supposed to be a bus line that departs from here to Innsmouth. Buses, you think to yourself, are not only an environmentally friendly means of transportation, they're also easy on your wallet. Sadly, the departure boards aren't of much help. New York, Maine, Rhode Island, no trace of Innsmouth as a destination. You wander around for a while until you notice a cleaner eating a sandwich on the side of one of the vending machines. You look around, talk to the cleaner. Excuse me, where can I find the bus to Inns? Without letting go of a sandwich, the cleaner points to an abandoned counter in the dingiest corner that a public bus station could be capable of. The man gives you a nod, indicating that anything can be said has indeed been said. You find that the counter is elaborately decorated with cobwebs. It's a bit early for Halloween preparations, but at least someone's made an effort. At the moment, nobody seems to be there. You press your face against the plastic window to peer into the room behind. Hello? Hello, is anyone there? I have to go to Innsmouth. No one there. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a bus ticket appears on the counter. Might the trip be free? Oh, that seems great. Um, should you leave a payment? I'll leave a donation to the 
uh, inevitable murderer of me. You're a staunch defender of the law. It goes without saying that you pay. You put a few coins in the bowl underneath the foggy glass window. Hopefully they won't be stolen by the next passenger. Even if someone were sitting behind the counter, you wouldn't be able to see him. It's just too dark. You are distracted for a few seconds and suddenly there's some change on the counter. What's that in amongst the coins? A small golden fishing hook? How strange. Seems fishy. Where's this bus hiding? In between the polished greyhounds and travelers stowing their luggage, saying goodbye and dropping tiredly into their seats, there's a kind of dumpster. A dumpster with windows and wheels? That's what I called my first car. No, it's actually a bus. It's a bit on the rusty side, and even from a distance you sense the strange smell it emits. Is that sulfur? No, that's just public transportation. You're not convinced how this thing is supposed to drive. In its vicinity, everything is noticeably quieter than at the other bus stops. The people getting on show no sign of emotion. That's public transportation. Nobody's trying to jump the queue here. Instead, the passengers move past the bus driver at a uniform speed, one after the other, shuffling up the creaking steps. Each two-seater bench is occupied by individuals, as if they want to make sure not to come into contact with their fellow passengers. The sign clearly says in's mouth. No departure times, no stopovers. Just in's mouth. Undecided you're standing on the stairs of the bus. What? I mean, I'd like to talk to the driver, see what's going on. You stop. The passengers behind you wait patiently. It's impossible to make eye contact with the driver. He stares rigidly at his steering wheel. After all, he seems to be a focused driver. Excuse me, sir. No reaction. You look over your shoulder and still the people in the line behind you remain calm. I feel like that's the first sign. Like, that's the first red flag for me. Dr bus drivers aren't focused. Come on. Show your ticket. You hand the driver the ticket. No reaction. At least you can't make out a reaction. The lighting is poor and the shadow of his dusty driver's cap covers almost his entire face. Maybe you're lucky. Maybe it'll be like a Harry Potter sequel. You notice something strange on his neck, but you can't quite make out what it might be. You're standing in the door, waiting for an okay, a nod, anything. The sulfur odor has increased. A queue has formed behind you, but no one is pushing or complaining. The people wait quietly and patiently. Get out of here! <laughs> That's how I uh, feel whenever there's a crowd. I just turn around and I scream at them to leave, maybe. I'm done with you, I say. <laughs> uh, just keep walking. You shuffle sideways through the center aisle. You don't remember the bus looking this long from the outside. You are surrounded by shabby two-seater benches, and some are already occupied. One traveler per row. The last bench is free. Looks like the upholstery's torn in some places, though, or has it been slit open? You can see springs with sharp wire edges, and some sticky liquid seems to have leaked onto the floor. Why didn't you just sit down one of the free rows? Here in the back, almost everything is occupied. Most of the passengers seem to have purposefully sat down in the aisle seats, blocking off the window seats. Maybe this is an opportunity to get a little closer to the common Innsmouth visitor. Sit down with someone. As a nonconformist, you join one of the passengers in a double seat. Since only one man was so considerate as to sit at the window, your options are limited anyway. As far as you can tell, the man is a haggard figure, with barely any luggage. I mean, we all have baggage, and you just can't see it. The hood of the gray jumper pulled far onto his face. The man looks out onto the street as if something very important is happening there that requires his attention. Is this seat taken, you ask politely? He turns his head and gives you a brief once-over. What? <laughs> Don't I recognize you from Angry Birds, I say? Without saying a word, he turns away. Sit down anyway. All right, that wasn't a no either. You sit down and regret it instantly. The smell of sulfur is now overpowered by something else, something that smells like it's been in the sun for too long. You're trying to catch a glimpse of what's under that hoodie. Does this person have genetic defect? Is he malner- Does this person have genetic defect? That is- What? No! Uh, okay. All right. Mo All right, moving on from that. Is he malnourished? You're not sure exactly where the problem might be, but you're trying to stay professional. You awkwardly stare at the headrest of the person in front of you. At least you're not kicking it like most people in public transportation. Talk to the stranger next to you. Awkward silence is my usual go-to, but this is a chance to get some inside information. Do small talk about veganism. Look the passenger over. Play the tourist. I guess in true uh, vegan fashion, let's talk about it. I'm currently trying to live vegan. The renunciation of animal products detoxifies not only the body, but also the planet. Your neighbor turns to you and listens to your boring explanation. His pale green face is solidified into a mask. 
A mask of fascination, perhaps? It's hard to tell if you're boring him. Continue talking. I mean, that's how I run a stream. It's hard to tell if you're boring them. Just keep talking. Some people just have to be taken by the hand during conversations. You don't even have to do without the comforts of life. You go on thanks to treats like satan, pizza, roasted sprouts, tofu, pasta, and of course, cocoa avocado brownies. I have had cocoa avocado brownies. They're delicious. The man seems to get paler with every second. He turns his gaze away from you and stares back at the good old headrest in front of him. He ignores all further attempts on your part to start a conversation for the rest of the journey. He's probably thinking about what you said. Probably how, like, he's on public transportation. He can't afford avocados. The bus leaves the country road and turns off at a wooden sign that says Innsmouth in red flaky letters. The journey continues rather bumpily along a narrow dirt road littered with numerous potholes. Oh, they're in Indiana. In the distance, some houses are already visible. Seagulls circling the roofs of the outermost edge of the city. Slowly, all passengers take their bags out from under their seats and get ready. Curiously, you look through the front window. You lean into the aisle and look past the bus driver to the path that still lies ahead of you. The bus rumbles along the street, past the first old houses. The road you turn into is narrow and bumpy. If we were met by oncoming traffic or even just a cyclist, what would the bus driver do, you think? Your group seems to be lucky, no other travelers, far and wide. You look around and it all is rather unexpectedly idyllic. The front door of the bus opens with a squeak and you join the monotonous line of locals stepping out of the bus as if in a daze. Almost walking in step, you all get closer to the exit. As you walk down the steps, you have to protect your eyes from the sunlight. Turns out the windows of the bus were tinted. The other passengers shuffle off. Like, what is that, like a limo bus? Finally, in's mouth. You examine your surroundings while you stretch your legs, trying to unwind from the stressful journey. No artist could have adequately captured the serenity and beauty of this place. A clear blue sky lights up the town square, which is paved with bright limestone and surrounded by neo-colonial buildings reminiscent of 19th century New England. A fresh sea breeze carrying seagulls and locals going about their business. In the center of the square, water trickles from a fountain. As you stretch your limbs and breathe in the clean air, you're suddenly startled by the water feature right in front of you. The fountain is an enormous fish-like brass creature, an open jaw lined with shark-like fangs spouts brackish water down its massive and humanly contorted body. As if that wasn't enough, there appear to be human bodies squirming underneath its massive claws. Their faces are as contorted as yours is right now. How long have you been standing here? Eyes wide open in shock, you feel utterly paralyzed. You start to scan the town square and notice more and more disturbing details. On every corner, you spot ornamental statues and reliefs of fish. But these are not your classic harmless kind of fish. These are pagan symbols and grimaces of supernatural creatures from the darkest crevasses of the deep sea. In surrounding houses, you can see faces pressed against the windows. All the locals appear to be watching you. You suddenly start to think that the cries of the seagulls sound particularly human-like. They sound like humans crying out in pain. What happened to the idyllic scene from a few moments ago? Welcome to Innsmouth. Turn around. Welcome to Innsmouth. How nice of you to visit. A small elderly woman waves at you from afar. She beams at you as if you were her long lost grandchild. She seems very different to the boars you've met so far on the bus into town. Her squealing shakes you out of your nightmarish panic. It's so good to have you here. I've noticed you're very taken by our local fountain. It was built in 1704 by Abdul Necrotis, favorite artist and friend of Charles Dexter Tillinghast, the founder of Innsmouth. The central figure was a present, and it was supposed to commemorate their travels together to Cairo. You can clearly see the Egyptian influences in Necrotis's work. Here and here. She points wildly in every direction, and here! But I'm sure you've already noticed this yourself. You look like someone who knows his way around art, she says with a wide smile. You're still in shock. She beams at you. Who the hell are you? <laughs> That's how I greet everyone that doesn't have a name tag. Of course, I'm an art historian. I gotta go. Who the hell are you? Oh, have I not introduced myself? I'm ever so sorry. In front of you now stands a small, plump person in a tasteless costume. Your rudeness doesn't seem to curb her enthusiasm in the slightest. Perhaps it uh, Seinfeld her enthusiasm or another Larry David show? My name is Muriel Pooping Place. I'm the director of the Parks Commission, chief tourism officer, and head of the welcoming committee. Ta-da! Uh, also, owner of a very unfortunate name. 
Behind Muriel, there's a ramshackle wooden information stand lovingly decorated with balloons, a colorful painted sign reads, Welcome to Inn's Mouth. Muriel tiptoes over to her information stand and picks up a whole load of flyers and leaflets from the rickety display cases. She looks down at the all the paper in her arms and briefly shrieks with laughter. Oh, that was a typo. My goodness, why don't you take the city map to begin with? Useful, you take the map and put it in your coat pocket. You're a regular door of the Explorer now. Would you uh, like find out more about our wonderful town, which has been awarded the East Coast Stunning Town Award for several years in a row? That's another typo. And would you? Uh, actually, I'm looking for someone. Uh, actually, I'm looking for someone. Here I am. The small, plump woman starts giggling. <laughs> In's mouth welcomes you warmly. So you're looking for someone. It's not that uncommon for two lonely hearts to find one another in this romantic place. Ma'am, this isn't later staters. Muriel winks at you. Mention the missing girl. Oh, hello, Muriel. <laughs> oh, I have, it's true love and uh, a kidnapping all in once. Mention the missing girl. You see, I'm looking for this girl. Uh, it's always about a girl, isn't it? Tap of the Marsh, eight years old. Her mother asked me to take on the case. You take out the photo and Muriel immediately rips it out of your hand. Oh, what a cutie! But I'm sorry to say I have not heard anything about missing girls. How awful. This sort of thing doesn't happen in Nitten's mouth. Perhaps you can have a look around at the beach or on the playground? There are a lot of kids around there. I'm sure that's where the little one will be. Within a naturally wide grin, she hands you back the photo, turns around quickly, and makes her way over to accost another tourist family. You head further into town along the cobbled road in the direction of the coast. Not long ago, the sun was bright in the sky, but already the first wafts of mist are creeping into the streets. The air feels thicker, and the sun can no longer penetrate the fog. Time to think about where you want to go. You slow down, you lean your briefcase against the wall, and start pacing up and down the quiet alleyway. You've got an important choice to make right now. The city center is in the north. Even from afar, you can see the outlines of the old and ornately decorated buildings in the main town square. Here you should find the police station, the main shopping street, and of course the town hall. As a coastal town, Innsmouth also has a harbor. From your research, you found out that this is a bustling area with a dreamy beach. You expect there to be mostly tourists. According to your research, the only hotel in town, the Gilman Hotel, is located in the old town. You think about checking in. You could do with freshening up and getting rid of that bus smell that is still clinging to your clothes. Just as you are about to set off, your heart leaps into your throat. You've forgotten your briefcase. This has never happened to you. You usually take good care of the little you possess. Um, there's nothing you can do about this now. You'll have to wait until your return journey to find out whether someone has handed it in at the Lost and Found. Still, you could swear that the briefcase was already gone when you got off the bus. You decide on the city center. Innsmouth Town Square, the beating heart of the city, a big attraction for local tourism. It is animated by groups of visitors who are chatting away in the sun. A lot less animated are the lethargic locals who are lurching about the square. A rather creepy looking fountain is in the middle of the square, keeping with their themes. A gigantic fish-like stone statue stretches its claws toward the sky with water flowing out of its menacing jaw. The water sprays into the air, providing a refreshing breeze to the tourists sitting around the edge of the fountain. Looking at it closely now, it all rather looks like a giant drooling fish monster. The square is surrounded by handsome old buildings, although the side streets reveal the true end's mouth. Crumbling facades, just far enough away that the average tourist doesn't notice them immediately. That's how I deal with my mental health. Like, uh, people don't notice it from far away, but up close, it's just like, whoo! You also notice the mean grimaces of gargoyles sternly looking down onto the visitors from the corners of their buildings. You make a mental note to block out the inn's mouth architecture in future. At first glance, you can see the town hall and a police station behind the fountain. There should be a few more public facilities nearby, but you don't notice anything right away. I'm gonna go to the police station and ask about the missing girl. You enter the precinct and find yourself in a small foyer. A counter separates visitors from the actual office of the police officers on duty. It's standard practice, observed even in a cranky little town like Innsmouth. A chilly, not particularly inviting old building with only a single narrow window on the northernmost wall. The room is bathed in a yellowish light, but rather than a warming glow, it's much more like a warm sick. Very Instagrammy. Yellow wallpaper is about to come loose from the walls, probably a process that has been ongoing for years, the exciting finale of which you can witness today. Almost every one of the poisonous green tiles on the floor has cracks. Shit. Can you go back? You can't return? 
Like you can't take a step back in the A policeman is on reception desk duty. He looks at you through dull eyes. The police station gives off the same lethargic vibe that you've come to expect from Innsmouth by now, but who knows, maybe they can help you anyway. You talk to the guard personnel. Okay, get down to the point. The life of a little girl is in danger. The wooden floorboards creak under your shoes as you approach the cop. They sound like moaning of an of an audience they sound like moaning of an audience somewhere in the distance commenting on a display of epic stupidity the cop on duty has been watching you intently ever since you entered the room he clears his throat before talking to you what is this monsters incorporated why am i not like noticing this so you want to file a missing person report yes that's why i'm here you answer truthfully you're a little startled how does he know this can you read your mind perhaps you think to yourself he should quit his job and make a lot of dough playing blackjack in vegas the cop rummages around for a notepad and pen how do you know about that the cop looks askance at the board with all the missing people reports and incredibly slowly his eyes find yours again i'm a good judge of character he stares at you asks for support with the tab of the case so, please let me know all the details. The cop interrupts in a monotonous and bored voice. His eyes train on his notepad. Then we can start pursuing the case. So, this is about Tabitha Marsh. Thinking about it, I wonder if a missing persons report has already been filed. Could you please let me know about any news in the case? Cop frowns. Tabitha? Nah, I've never heard that name before. What, are you sure? Her mother hired me to find her. Why would she first go to a PI in a different town before alerting the police? All of a sudden, the eyes of the cop grow large. He gets out of his chair. Hold on, I'm gonna ask my colleagues. Don't you have a PC or something to check this sort of thing? Or a filing cabinet? Cuts. The man murmurs without looking at you. He disappears through the back door, and for a moment you can peek into the back office. It doesn't really seem like anyone is truly working in there. Lots more tired figures looking at you, somewhat bored until the door clicks shut again. You're alone in the foyer. Uh, do you start singing a Michael Jackson song or do you wait around? I'll wait around. You can hear people discussing something agitatedly in the office, but it's too quiet to make out what they're saying. The cop returns shortly after. My mistake. You're correct. There's already a filed report. We'll be in touch with you. The cop clasps his hands and puts on a fake smile. Was that it? Give him your phone number. Maybe we can get drinks sometime. Uh, do you want to take my phone number? You dig your mobile out of your pocket. Remembering your own phone number has long been on your list of things to get round to. Still no reception. Might be the building causing it. I'm afraid I don't have reception in here. The cop leans back and gives you a cold smile. No problem. We'll find you. Well, great. You sense danger. Leave now or you're going to regret it. Sometimes in life, there are these special moments. For example, when you're about to drop a plate or that moment when you trip over a root while jogging. You only have seconds to correct the error, to catch the plate or to find your running rhythm again or to leave the police station. I uh, deal with this by never going jogging. Something tells you that you're wasting your time here. You say goodbye quickly and under the stern watch of the cop on duty, you leave the station. So you step outside, you start wondering whether you had seen the guy's eyes blink at all. Oh well, not that important. You leave the police station. When the heavy door snaps shut behind you, you exhale. Without noticing, you have been holding your breath ever since, turning your back towards the little wooden desk. There was something off about that cop, and it didn't take an online detective course to figure that out. Where do you go next? I do what? Just into the alleyways to the harbor. Preferably the David Harbor. 